The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit wogcc.com. Well, the title of my message today, if you are a note taker, is Intentionally Inconvenienced. I want you to write that down if you're a note taker. Intentionally Inconvenienced. When we, uh, growing up, when we moved around a lot, and I think that my mom and I put the figures together one time and tried to remember all the different houses that we lived in when I was a kid, and we came up with 26, all right? So I moved 26 times throughout my childhood and adolescence before I, uh, I got married and moved out of the house. And it was mainly because of my dad's job. My dad was a pipe fitter, and so he would work shutdown jobs. So we'd be six months here, we'd be a year or two here, and we would just constantly move around wherever there was work for him to go and to weld. And people always ask me where I'm from. I always think that's a funny question because I was born in Oklahoma but I just tell them Arkansas because that was the last place that I moved up here from. But before I moved to Wisconsin, if I, I began to kind of think about that question. If where you're from is determined by where you've lived the longest, next year I'll be from Sheboygan Falls. <laughs> <clears throat> because that will be the longest place I've ever lived. Before that, the longest place that I ever lived was a little town in Louisiana called Lily. It was right on the border of Arkansas and Louisiana, and my family was the only white family in the neighborhood, all right? And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I went to school in a little racist community where the black kids and the white kids actually rode separate buses, and I rode the black kids' bus, and it was awesome. Um, And I actually have a picture that I want to show you. It's a picture of me as a kid um, and there's me and my doll, my uh, B.A. Baracus bad attitude. Uh, I pity the fool that messes with me and my B.A. Baracus doll. So w- here we were in this racially divided community, and here's this pasty white kid carrying around his Mr. T doll. <laughs> Even though I am probably the whitest skin tone person you will ever meet, and I burn lobster red if I'm out in the sun longer than 15 minutes, I would regularly go down the street in my little neighborhood in Lily and eat lunch with Miss Florida May. She would cook up some soul food for me. You know, some turkey necks, some collard greens, some hot water cornbread. And I would go over there and eat all the time. And she would say, baby, you come on back tomorrow. Miss Florida May is going to cook you up something nice. <laughs> I think that my skin tone is just a disguise or... <laughs> Or maybe it, I am the result of God's skin tone printer running out of ink, and maybe one of the angels <laughs> forgot to order. I don't know what it is, but I love that neighborhood. It was my favorite place as a child. As I think back to all my childhood memories, I loved living in that neighborhood more than any other house that we ever lived in. I have my best memories there. People cared about one another in that neighborhood, and even though my family was the racial minority, it didn't matter. And spending six years in that neighborhood would one day prove very helpful when I was in the fifth grade. See, in our school, the racial tensions just didn't exist between the adults. It existed between some of the children as well. And in our little racially divided southern town, some of the black kids played tackle football below a hill just out of the teacher's sight. Now, they weren't allowed to play tackle football. We were only allowed to play touch football. But it was below the hill out of the teacher's sight, so they would get away with it. And I knew that's what they were doing. And anyway, sometimes I go down there and play football with them. And, and I remember one day that they were down there playing football and they had a bright orange Nerf football. And I remember they were out there playing and there was a kid that started picking on me and he started kicking me. And then, then this other kid comes up and there's these three big white kids. I mean, they're just these big kids. And I, here I was, this little skinny, pasty fifth grader. And they start pushing me around. And I don't remember why we got into this little scuffle, but I was very docile kid. I was very shy, believe it or not. I wasn't this kid that was getting into a lot of trouble. And so I don't remember all the circumstances around why I was being picked on. But these three big white kids started pushing me around and kicking me. And to the point where I would fall down and it would hurt, you know, uh, so much that I could barely get back up. Like my stomach was hurting, kick me in the stomach. Or, you know, they were just really causing me a lot of problems. I couldn't even run away. And I remember trying to pick myself up off the ground as a fifth grader and trying to get away from these boys. And out of one corner of my eye, I saw these three boys coming towards me and know that they're just going to kick me again and they're going to hurt me. And the teacher's just missing all of this. And I'm trying to get up and I finally get up and I stumbled. 
because I was in so much pain. But as I stumbled, my vision was focused right on all of my friends down the hill playing football. And all of a sudden, I saw an orange Nerf football hit the ground. And then next thing I know, there were probably 20, 25 kids from the bottom of the hill that ran up to the top of the hill. And they got up in these three boys' faces that were hurting me. And what was now one versus three quickly became three versus 25. And they said, if you mess with him, you mess with all of us. I never had problems in school again. <laughs> so I'm grateful for where I was raised and how I was raised up. But racism is not a new problem. It was, it was around in Jesus' day. The Jewish people and the Samaritans were two different races of people that were very much at odds with one another. And the Jews referred to Samaritans as dogs. They didn't even call them Samaritans. They just call them dogs. So you can just sense the racial tension. So this isn't something new just in America that we deal with. These people had a rough history. And any interaction between the Jews and the Samaritans was socially looked down upon. And sometimes it was even legally forbidden. This is the atmosphere that we find ourselves in as we go to Luke chapter 10. So why don't you open up your Bible over to Luke chapter 10. And let's look at this story of this Samaritan person. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, Gospel of Luke reads this way, And behold, a lawyer stood up to Jesus, wanting to test him. And this lawyer said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, man. Verse 26, Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27 says, And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And in Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he was not really satisfied with that. He wanted to justify himself. So when he asked Jesus the question, when, when he asked him this question of what do I do to inherit eternal life, what he was really after, have you ever been asked a question like that where you know what someone wants to, what, the answer they want you to give when they ask you a question? You know, this is kind of what was happening. The answer that he really wanted was for Jesus to say, oh, you're good. You're good. You know what? Y you are going to get eternal life. You're going to get eternal life so good. <laughs> you're going to get so much eternal life because you're so good. That's what he was looking for because now he's wanting to justify himself. He said, who is my neighbor? You tell me to love my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied this way with a story. A parable, he says, it, he says this in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, there was a priest that was going down that road, and he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. And then a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. Then he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Then Jesus says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go do likewise. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, everyone is your neighbor. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we had a low attended, uh, low, low, low attended service one night. We were used to having probably about you know, 40 or so kids in the youth group, and we only had about six or seven show up one night during the summer. And I remember a kid yelling out, hey, where is everybody? I said, what do you mean? Everybody is everybody. <laughs> when all of a sudden does everybody stop being everybody? Here is Jesus answering the question of who is my neighbor? What do you mean who is your neighbor? Everybody is everybody. Everybody is your neighbor. Because this guy would, be, would have been blown away. This Jewish lawyer would have been blown away by this story 
of a Samaritan helping this guy when the priest walked by, when the Levite walked by. Man, what, what, what a mind-blowing situation because this guy would have never thought that that would have been his responsibility because here's the Samaritan who comes by. That was the last person he thought would have ever extended his hand and helped. See, Jesus always illustrated in extremes because he wanted to show how extreme that the heart of God is. Too often we're just like the lawyer. We're asking the wrong question. Who is my neighbor? We're focused on the wrong things because the lawyer's focused on doing it right instead of just doing it. He wants to make sure that, you know, he's following everything he needs to follow in order to do everything that he needs to do in order to be accepted instead of just allowing the love and compassion of God to overtake him to where it begins to drive his behavior. Instead of helping everyone or helping those that are your neighbor, he wants to know who his neighbor is so he can know who he's supposed to help. How narrow-minded of a question is that? You see, we, we ask the wrong questions like the lawyers, and we ask those on ourselves here where he really wanted just to hear he was a good person. He wanted a convenient gospel. He wanted a convenient Christianity. He wanted a convenient answer. But Jesus gave him a very inconvenient answer. And you and I, sometimes, we want the same thing. We want convenient church. We want convenient gospel. We want it to work around our schedule. We want it to work around our lifestyle. We want it to work around the things that we want to do. But yet, here, Jesus painted a picture of a very inconvenient situation that was not ideal to the players that were involved, and it wasn't even a socially acceptable type of move that would have garnered a lot of praise. Matter of fact, it would have been like, you, you let who help you? You, you? you drank water that he gave you? You, you mean you rode on his animal? What, what is the deal here? This guy's a Samaritan. Don't you know? You see... Oftentimes we want everything to be convenient, but the heart of God wants us to understand who our neighbor is, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient, because eternal impact opportunities, which is what we're talking about here, eternal impact opportunities, an opportunity to impact eternity with your life, are almost always inconvenient. Oh, I'm going to say that again. I don't even care that's on the screen. I know you can read. But eternal impact opportunities are almost always inconvenient. The Samaritan man, he, he was inconvenienced in four ways. As I was studying this, I, I, I kind of want to pull out four different ways that we can look at how this guy was inconvenienced. The Samaritan man was inconvenienced with his schedule. He was going somewhere. He wasn't just riding around on his donkey or camel or whatever going, oh, I wonder if somebody got robbed. Let me go see if somebody got robbed around here. I'm looking for somebody to help because people get robbed around here all the time. Let me go find somebody that's been beat up and help them. No, he was going somewhere. And there happened to be a guy that got beat up and robbed, a guy who got taken advantage of, a guy who was wounded, a guy who was struggling, a guy who was left for dead. And two other guys that were supposed to be righteous guys passed by and didn't want anything to do with the guy because he was an inconvenience to them. They had somewhere to go. They had something to do. They had to keep on trucking. But here's this Samaritan who stops and says, I will inconvenience my schedule and where I'm going to be. And he couldn't even send a text message to let him know he's going to be late wherever he was going. He just said, you know what? It's worth it because I want to help this person. So his schedule. The other thing that was inconvenient was his supplies. This guy did not pack supplies for this man that had be been beaten up. He didn't say, let me carry some extras just in case I run into a guy that got robbed and beat up. Those were his supplies. That was his stuff. He packed for himself. Because when you go on vacation, you don't go, let me pack uh, you know, an extra set of clothes for the week just in case I run into somebody that needs clothes. We don't think that way. This guy wasn't thinking that way either. He packed for himself. He looked and assessed what he needed for the trip, and he put together his own supplies. And so he inconvenienced himself by giving up of things that he had prepared for himself. So his supplies were inconvenienced. His schedule was inconvenienced. His supplies were inconvenienced. And his comfort, that's the third thing that was inconvenienced. 
because he did not ride that animal in hopes to find someone who had been beaten up and robbed so that he could let them use his animal. Man, all of a sudden, this guy is cruising along on his animal, and he is just enjoying himself. It's a nice, beautiful day on this trip. And then, next thing I know, i got to get off of my animal so that some person that I have racial tension issues with historically can get upon this animal, and I have to walk. It wasn't like, get in the back, you know. It wasn't like, oh, you can ride in the back of the truck, or you can ride in the back seat of the car, or the back seat of the van. It was, I'm going to walk, you're going to ride the animal. Wow. Wow. So his comfort was inconvenienced. And then the last thing that was inconvenienced was his wallet. Because not only did he give the man his time, not only did he give the man his stuff, not only did he give the man his animal, his comfort, his transportation, but he also was willing to make an eternal impact in this man's life by paying for him a place to stay at the end. And he told the innkeeper, he said, listen, he said, if this guy wakes up and wants to stay around because he's still too wounded and he's still too tired, I'm going to come back through here. You let me know about it and I'll pay the difference of whatever this amount of money doesn't cover. Wow. This guy was inconvenienced through his schedule, his supplies, his comfort and his wallet. And you would think, what on earth would drive this man to do this for a person who there's already a natural reason that exists in their society for them not to want to help each other. I mean, it would make a little bit more sense for the Levite to have been inconvenienced for this man or, or the priest. I mean, everybody thinks like a priest would stop, right? I mean, come on. You would, you would expect this guy to stop and inconvenience himself. You would go, oh, yeah, that's a good thing for a priest to do or for that Levite to do. But the guy in town that nobody likes naturally because of our history between our two races, all of a sudden that's the guy that stops and that's the guy that helps. That's the guy that inconveniences all of these things for someone he doesn't even know. He risked a lot. What if it was a trap? What if it was a setup? It didn't matter to the Samaritan. The Samaritan still helped him because he had something driving his behavior. What drove his behavior? Look over in verse 33. Verse 33 says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where this man was, and when he saw him, he had what? He had compassion. Compassion drove this man to inconvenience himself to make an impact on this person's life that he had never met and didn't know. It'd be different if he knew the guy. It'd be different if it was, you know, me who grew up in the neighborhood I grew up in getting help from all my buddies playing football. It'd be different getting that kind of help, but from someone you don't know? What are you talking about? This is mind-blowing to this lawyer, but compassion was driving this man's behavior because here's what compassion will do, folks. Compassion will cause you to do what no one else will do to reach someone no one else has. Compassion will cause you to do something that no one else will do so you can reach someone no one else has. For us to reach our neighbor, we have to come to terms with the fact that we're going to be inconvenienced if we want to make an eternal impact. We just got to come to terms with that. And we've got to understand if we're really going to be about the Father's business, if we're really going to be about letting our light shine, being that city on a hill that won't be hidden by being those representatives of Christ, it's not a convenient Christianity. It's not a convenient task. It's not something where Jesus says, lay down some of your life and come and follow me. Pick up the lightest cross and come follow me. Don't, don't lay all of your stuff down and, and, and don't be a complete living sacrifice. Be a, a good 20% sacrifice of your life for the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that. We see here that over and over in Scripture, Jesus wants us to be all in. Amen? Amen. Be all in for the kingdom. Be all in for eternal impact because He has called us and appointed us 
for such a time as this to make an impact in the areas that he has given us influence over, in the areas that he has placed us in. He has given us responsibility in our neighborhoods. He's given us responsibility on our job. He's given us responsibility when we're out and about and doing business in this community. He's given us responsibility as a church to make sure that we are doing our part to impact eternity and that we're willing to be inconvenienced to do it. We're willing to say, Lord, my time is not really my time. My money is not really my money. My stuff is not really my stuff. My comfort is not really my comfort. Lord, this is all for you and it's all for your glory. And if we could catch a picture of that, man, it would change the way we prioritize our time, the way we prioritize the things that we want to have and the way we possess them and the way that we take care of them. And it would completely change the way that we use finances as well. So how far are you willing to be inconvenienced for eternity's sake? That's really the question that you need to write down and you need to ask yourself. Is how far are you willing to be inconvenienced for eternity's sake? What is the level of inconvenience for this Samaritan? He didn't even stop and consider the fact that this guy was not a fellow Samaritan. He didn't stop and consider that this guy's a Jew. This, somebody might be talking. He didn't stop and consider, oh, man, I hope nobody comes around while I'm helping this guy. <laughs> uh, let's get those bandages on quicker, buddy. Come on. Uh, the priest might be by. The Levite might come by. Someone that knows me might come by, and then they're going to talk about me. Let's hurry up with this. You should be grateful for what I've given you. Just mosey on the way. I mean, at what extent? Has the guy done enough? Think about this for a minute. What point of that story had the Samaritan really done enough? Was it the point where he, you know, stopped and gave him something to, to drink and, you know, kind of bound up his wounds? Maybe that's a good stopping point for some of us. And we go, that's good enough. I'll only have compassion that far. But the Samaritan, then he says, hey, how about you get on my animal? Okay, Wow. He put him on his own animal. That, that's far enough. I have been inconvenienced far enough. But then he takes him to an inn and he says, Hey, innkeeper, I've got good credit with you. Here's a down payment. I'll come back and just check on and see if I owe you anything else. Give this guy anything he needs. How far? Was this guy willing to go over and over again? He's continually stretching the limit of the inconvenience that he's willing to undergo for one person. For one person. For one person. How far are we willing to go? How far are we willing to inconvenience ourselves for an eternal impact? There was no plan to reach this man. He didn't say, oh, there's a guy over there in need. Let me go back and have a meeting and form committees and subcommittees and let's all strategize on how to reach this man. The man is laying there, beat up, dying. He, he's, he's helpless over here. Let's go strategize all this to make sure that we... No, he just moved in the moment. Why? Because there was a need. The man didn't possess any special skills. It wasn't like, well, I'm not skilled enough to be able to properly bandage this man, so hopefully somebody that's better at bandaging than, than I am, you know, comes by and helps him. All the excuses that we make. Maybe somebody else can do this. Maybe someone else is better at this. I, I, don't, I don't know how to properly bandage up somebody. Sorry, guy. I, I don't know what else to do for you. You see, he didn't allow discrimination to play a role. He didn't allow busyness to play a role. How many of those things are limiting factors in our lives? How many of those things cause us to make excuses to why we don't reach our neighbor? How many of us have allowed that type of fear to keep us from even inviting someone to church? See, listen, people are people. My neighbor is my neighbor. Everybody is everybody, right? It doesn't matter your skin tone. It doesn't matter your country of origin. It doesn't matter your background. People are people. It doesn't matter how much money they make. It doesn't matter how talented they are. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born on. People are people, and God has given us 
The responsibility to reach people, to care about people, it's a part of the flow of loving God. You see, when I love God, what am I going to do? I'm going to love what God loves. And what does God love? He loves people. For God so loved the world that his love for people caused him to give his only begotten son. Amen, somebody. You see, here's the deal. And I want you to get this. You can reach your neighbor for Christ. Stop wondering who my neighbor is. You can reach your coworker for Christ. You can reach your boss for Christ. You can reach that waiter or waitress that you're going to encounter later on this afternoon or evening for Christ. You can reach that person that may be behind the checkout register at the store that maybe you go to for Christ. But we have to start stepping out in faith to love people and quit being those religious people that just walk on by making excuses. We've got to love someone. We've got to have compassion on them. We have to be willing to inconvenience ourselves for eternity's sake. So let me ask you this question. Is God pulling on your heart right now because because maybe, maybe he's dealing with you about something? Maybe you haven't been willing to let go of your schedule to invest in your neighborhood, to invest in relationship with people. Not to where you go take a handful of tracks and you knock on someone's door and say, hey, you're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. Read this. Tell you how to love people. Not that type of stuff, but where we're willing to inconvenience ourselves to build relationship with someone, to let them know we care, to do some of the stuff that maybe Arnie was talking about last week, to inconvenience ourselves, to be able to serve other people in simple ways, to be able to show them the love of Christ in our daily walk, to be willing to go, you know what, I really want to go do something else, but I know that I need to sit and listen to this person and talk to the one that may be struggling or maybe they're normally really energetic and high energy and they're full of joy, but today they just seem like all their joy is zapped. Even though I have a lot of other things I'd rather do, maybe even a lot of things I plan to do, but instead, because of my compassion, I'm willing to sit down and just listen to someone. You see, folks, this doesn't have to be this huge, big thing that we make it out to be. Because oftentimes, the bigger we make it and the further away from our personal skill sets and areas of confidence we make it, the less likely we ever are to step out in faith and do anything. It's always in the simple things, folks. It's in the day-to-day things. It's in your everyday interaction with other people and the way that you love people and the way that you treat people. Maybe we're not willing to let go of our schedule and God's dealing with you about that. Or maybe you have maybe someone in your uh, neighborhood that may be different from you, whether they're in a different social economic class, maybe they're either someone who may be a very affluent person or maybe someone who may be a very poor person, and maybe you're not used to hanging out in your circle of friends with people who are that much more affluent than you or maybe people that are that much more in poverty than you and you don't know how to relate, and so therefore you just stay away. Or maybe because of their skin tone, or maybe because of their country of origin, you don't you feel like I can't relate, I can't connect, and you have these natural prejudices and biases that keep us separated. How far are you willing to be inconvenienced to welcome someone else in your home that may be different from you? You see, maybe you're not willing to let go of supplies that God has blessed you with. Maybe there's things that God has given you that are actually supposed to be tools. For his kingdom. There are things that you either have access to or things that you have that God has given you those types of things to be used to impact eternity, but you're not willing to let those things go. And God's really pulling on your heart about that right now because you know what those things are that he has given you that you have that he wants you to use for his kingdom to impact eternity. Maybe it's your own comfort that he's dealing with you about, that you haven't been willing to sacrifice. Maybe, maybe he, he's saying you need to step out in faith and you need to just maybe even invite that person to church next week or invite them to one of our Easter services. Or, or maybe you just need to ask them to come with you and sit with you and, and you know God's been dealing with you, but it just makes you too uncomfortable to ask that question because you're afraid of rejection. 
or you're afraid of being labeled, or you're afraid of what other people will think. And God's saying, yeah, it's time for you to move outside of that area of comfort for you because it's an intentional inconvenience. Have you been holding on to finances and not budgeting generosity and prioritizing generosity? God gave us a great way to do this, to start with the tithe, with 10%, not just give him some if you have left over. He wanted us to prioritize generosity because a person that is living compassionately is living generously. The two go hand in hand. The, they do. The two just go hand in hand. It starts with your tithe. It starts with being generous and it grows from there. It's not the limit. It's not, oh, I tithe so I'm good and I check it off the list. No, I want to grow to a place where I give away more than I keep. But you have to start somewhere. That's why God gives us that starting place. So what is the thing that God is calling you to? What is the thing he's telling you to be inconvenienced for? What barriers or what excuses have held you back? Because Jesus said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And how the neighbor starts with loving God. And then you begin to love people because you love God. And God is a very sacrificial, generous, loving God who was willing to even give his own son for you and for me. He modeled the ultimate sacrifice by sending us Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody? So this is at the very heart of God. This is at the very core of God. And if we are followers of Christ, if we are people that say we love God, those types of attributes should flow out of us. So therefore, it doesn't become a, 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 a list that we mark off and we say, oh, I'm doing all these things and I feel proud of myself. And I'm like the lawyer that says, teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Tell me how good I am. Tell me how awesome I am. Tell me how much I have done for you. No, he says, you just got to love God and you got to love people. And if you do the compassion of God is going to flow out of you, and it's going to manifest itself in different ways. But I guarantee you it's probably going to manifest itself in inconvenient ways. Sometimes it's convenient. Sometimes it's easy. But most often i found in my life, anytime God has asked me to do something, it's always been inconvenient. Kind of like moving to Sheboygan Falls. 900 miles away, and I didn't know anyone. There were a lot of reasons that would have kept me away, and everybody was concerned about that because I got the same question over and over again five and a half years ago. How are you going to handle the snow? <laughs> they didn't want to know about my doctrine. They didn't want to know where I stood on this or that. The main thing was, how are you going to deal with snow? Because in Arkansas, where I moved from, you get half an inch of snow on the ground, and there's 50 cars in the ditch, and there's no bread or milk in the store, because apparently that's what we need to survive. <laughs> Two of the most perishable things you can buy. <laughs> I just don't understand. They have a short shelf life. We want those things to have the short shelf life. But that's kind of the deal. I'll never forget, man, when I worked in a grocery store uh, when it turned Y2K. You guys remember the Y2K bug? Everybody's freaking out. I was 18 years old working in a grocery store when Y2K hit, and we all lost everything, and it was complete blackout, and the government was completely overturned, and oh, wait a minute, none of that stuff happened, right? Yeah, it was fine. Some people lost power maybe for a minute or two, but, but I remember when that happened, and people were just coming in that grocery store like the world was coming to an end, just pulling water off the shelves and milk and bread. Everybody wanted that stuff, so it was really inconvenient maybe to make a transition from familiarity in the south to move up here. But when God calls you, when God puts something on your heart, it's most often not convenient. Because he's saying what you're going to do and what I've called you to do and what I've created you to do is going to make an impact and make a mark on eternity and it's going to bring glory to God. And for it to do that, it has to make us get to a place where we kind of need to deny ourselves to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. So how far are you willing to go to be inconvenienced for eternity's sake? So how to neighbor starts with loving God and loving people. The how and when flows out of the love and compassion. That's where it flows out of. So don't worry as much about the how and when, okay? So many people are wondering, well, how do I do this? Or when do I do this? Don't worry about the how and when. Just start loving God. This is easy stuff. 
And then start loving people. And when you see a need or God puts something on your heart, do it. <laughs> right? So what is your next step? What is your next step? Because you have to start somewhere. Don't sit around. Don't wait for some big revelation. You need to start somewhere. Where do you see a need and where is God stirring your heart with compassion? What has God been tapping you on the shoulder about lately? The thing that maybe is making you feel a little uncomfortable when you think about it too long, and so you think about something else. Or you turn on HGTV to distract yourself and watch Chip and Joanna Gaines remodel a house. And you get distracted because I don't want to think about that. Ooh, that's, that's uncomfortable. And then when the TV comes on, something happens on that show where they do something for someone that God is telling you to do for someone. You're like, no, I need to get away from it. And God just keeps reminding you throughout maybe a message on the weekend. And it's maybe not even something that I said, but maybe God in the moment began to stir something in your heart and the Holy Spirit spoke something to you that didn't even come out of my mouth, but it was something that God was dealing with you personally about. That's what's so cool about what we do by gathering in a church and hearing a message is that the Holy Spirit makes this personal for every person. So even though you're hearing me say the same words, you're interpreting it very differently because that's the Holy Spirit making it personal to you. Because the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, all right? The Holy Spirit's dealing with each one of us on an individual level, saying, you know what your next step is. And if you don't know what to do and you, you don't have this huge big plan, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Maybe for some of you, it's as simple as joining Team Wog and helping us get to that 220 mark that we're believing God for this year. And you just begin to serve. You begin to serve other people. I know it's not convenient for you to do that. I know it may not be in your wheelhouse and in your space. But what Scripture says, only do it if it's convenient and if it works out. Maybe it'll require you to wake up a little earlier. Maybe it'll require a little bit more of your time. How far are you willing to go to impact eternity? Maybe it means you have that conversation with your neighbor that, man, you've lived there for like 10 years and you've never even said hello to the person down the street, but you know that they always drive their car too fast through your neighborhood and it makes you mad. Maybe God's telling you to go love on that person and go knock on their door and say, hey, I've lived down here for like 10 years and I see you all the time. You're a really fast driver. <laughs> Your car goes really fast. And I just wanted to invite you to church. You could get here really quick. <laughs> Whatever it may be, folks, start somewhere. Maybe you see a new house uh, for sale in your neighborhood and there's a moving truck and God puts it on your heart to go do something simple like, you know, Make them something to eat or just, just bring them a, a, a welcome to the neighborhood deal. Whatever it is. Just loving on people. Simple ways. Sitting and listening to that coworker that you know is in a rough spot. Being there for that friend or family member. For some, it may be getting engaged in giving financially and being more regular and intentional with it. Because a lot of times when people give, they have this idea that if I have some left over, then I give to God. But God says, no, do it on the front end. Because if you do it on the front end, you get to see how faithful God is and how he begins to work everything out and you find that he supplies all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you don't live in lack or fear, but you actually seek first the kingdom of God. That's why the tithe is the first 10%, not the last whatever I got left to, to give. When we do that and we prioritize that, it causes us to live in a different way. It causes us to live by faith, but we're being intentional with it. My, my wife and I do something beyond our tithe every month. We, we always tithe off of our finances to our church here, Word of Grace, and we give that 10%, but then we have another set of money that we designate that we just call it our generous money, and we're looking for what, how God wants us to spend that money every month, and we're looking for someone or something. Um, this past month, I got a letter in the mail from someone that's going to be doing some type of trip, and I'm like, well, boom, there it is. I know exactly what I need to do. Sometimes you get that type of stuff, or maybe there's a need. Maybe you see someone who is down and out, or maybe you know of a situation, or whatever the case may be. We just allow God to kind of lead us with that money to do whatever he wants us to do with it, but what are you willing to do? Are you going to be intentional about it? That's the thing. It's not just doing it, but it's being intentional about it. It's saying, how can I intentionally inconvenience myself, my schedule, my supplies, my comfort, my wallet? What is God calling you to be intentionally inconvenienced for? I watched a, uh, watched a video 
of a sermon this past week. It was pretty cool. Um, it was an older sermon that I just stumbled upon, and it was given by a man who lived as a missionary in a remote jungle. And the natives kept stealing this missionary's pineapples. And they were so bold about stealing his pineapples, they would do it in plain sight. It wasn't even like they were trying to be sneaky about it. It was just kind of like they went to uh, get a pineapple, and he would look at them throughout the window, and they just kind of shrug their shoulders and move on, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're going to steal because these people were raised up basically as thieves in this, in this uh, village. And this missionary, he threatened them. He yelled at them. He would, uh, to do any, anything he could do to try to get the natives to stop stealing his pineapples. He got a dog. He did all kinds of stuff. And some things worked, some things didn't. But he, began, he, he got a reputation. He was known by the natives as the angry, long-nosed, bald, white man. He tried everything, but it didn't work. And then he finally came to the realization that these weren't his pineapples, but they were God's. And he told God that they were no longer his. And he said, God, I'm giving you the garden. I'm giving you the pineapples. They're your pineapples. But the locals, they didn't stop stealing the pineapples. But instead uh, of that same reaction that he used to have by yelling at them, being angry, he just didn't react at all. It was hard for him. But he really had to, in his heart, work this out to give these pineapples to God. This confused the natives a lot. Because for like the past four years that this guy had lived in this village, they were used to being yelled at. They were used to all these different tricks of how he would try to get you know, them to stay out of his pineapple garden. And then one day, after he had decided to give the, the pineapple garden to God, the chief of the village came and knocked on his door at this missionary's house. And he said, yes, chief, what can I do for you? He said, so you finally have decided to become a Christian. And he said, What? He said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, we heard you preaching about becoming a Christian, and we heard you talk about what it meant to be a Christian, so we thought you were trying to become one. He said, when you stopped yelling and being angry at everyone and stealing those pineapples, we thought you started acting more like the person that you were preaching and talking about being. And now we've, we're wondering, why are you acting so different? And we just figured it's because you became a Christian. And he said, well, I've always been a Christian. He said, but the difference is, is that he said, I tried to hold on to these pineapples and I had to realize all of this was God's. And so this thing I was trying to control, I had to say, God, it's yours. I said, and they're still abusing it. He said, but I gave it to God. He said, you gave your pineapple garden to your God. So the chief goes back, tells all the, the villagers that he gave this pineapple garden to God, and that's what changed him. And the natives were so scared that they might get changed too that they stopped stealing his pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> because they thought if that God could change this angry, long-nosed, bald-headed white man, what was he going to do to us if we took his pineapples? <laughs> but then this man, he realized that everything in his life was given to him by God, and he realized that God had called him to be a steward, not an owner. And he realized that that he had the exact same struggles with his time, with his spouse, with his money, with his children. And when he realized that to follow God is to recognize we're here for his glory and everything we have belongs to him, it changed his heart and his perspective on everything through a silly pineapple garden. So God inconvenienced us to make an eternal impact. Inconvenience our schedule because our time is yours. Inconvenience our supplies because they're all yours. Inconvenience our comfort because we are yours. It inconvenience our wallets to make an eternal impact, just as you did with the story of the good Samaritan because he was willing to be inconvenienced. So what is God dealing with you about that he wants you to be inconvenienced for and watch your next step? Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit WOGCC.com.